Autoimmune disease and the thyroid. Hi, Dr. So Parker again. Welcome to section two of PESA Productions Thyroid Eye Disease 10 part series. As always, we strongly recommend that you watch this series at least once in the order in which it was intended. If you haven't already viewed the first four videos of section one, you're encouraged to do so first. The material in this series is meant to be easily understood. Parts, however, may be somewhat dense and you may wish to review particular sections. If you have suggestions on how to improve this series, we welcome your comments. You may find us on the web at www.plasticeyesurgery.com, email us at info at pesahouston.com, write to us at Plastic Eye Surgery Associates, 3730 Kirby Drive, Suite 900, Houston, Texas, 77098, or telephone us at 713-795-0705. Section two of this video series on thyroid eye disease focuses on understanding autoimmune disorders in general and autoimmune disorders that may also affect the thyroid gland in particular. This section contains three short videos. The first video, Autoimmune Disease and the Thyroid, reviews what is an autoimmune disorder and how the thyroid may be affected. The second video in this section talks about what really are Graves and Hashimoto's diseases. And finally, the third video explains the relationship between thyroid eye disease and autoimmune thyroid disorders. Again, we'll start with discussing autoimmune diseases and the thyroid. To understand autoimmune disorders, we must first understand what is an antibody. Shortly after birth, our body makes tens of thousands of soldier proteins that circulate throughout our body in our bloodstream. Each of these soldier or policeman proteins is unique and has a specific receptacle appendage different from all others. We call these proteins antibodies. This name may be a little bit confusing since it means against body, but that's not really what antibodies are. In a general sense, antibodies are good. They protect us from things that are against our body and don't belong in our body. For example, bacteria, viruses, and even cancer cells. We've discussed before in prior videos the very specific way in which certain proteins may interact with other proteins, almost as specific as a key and a lock analogy. There are, however, important differences between the key lock analogy and how proteins may interact, and if you've missed that discussion, we encourage you to go back and review prior videos in section one. So here we see a bacterium, something that doesn't belong in our body. The bacterium floats along in our blood, and as it does so, the bacterium may come in contact with various antibodies. In this case, the bacterium does not fit into the appendage on an antibody that it encounters. And so the antibody floats on by. The bacterium encounters a second antibody, but this one's appendage also does not fit the bacterium. And so this antibody also floats away. The next antibody is not a perfect fit, but its appendage sort of fits. This activates the antibody to start the destruction of the bacterium while simultaneously cloning itself, making an army of similar antibodies. The closer the fit of the bacterium and the antibody's appendage, the larger the army that's produced. In making this army, there may be a little drift in the specific shape of the appendage, and those antibodies with even better fit are preferentially selected since they make their own armies even larger, even faster. This system is responsible for the efficacy of vaccines. Take, for example, the flu vaccine. Influenza viruses are chopped up and parts of the viral proteins are then injected into people. The body forms armies of antibodies against these proteins so that when the real influenza virus gets into the body, an army of antibodies destroys it before it can cause disease. We call the development of an antibody, army, immunity, and say we are immune to whatever it is that we have an army against. For example, most people get measles or mumps only once because we then become immune to these diseases by developing an antibody army. Although overall antibodies are good, sometimes things go awry and antibodies within us may see proteins that belong in us as being foreign. In these cases, our antibodies attack parts of ourselves, causing all kinds of problems. We call these disorders autoimmune diseases. Auto means self, as in automobile, 
or self-mobile or self-moving, or a device that moves itself, as opposed to one that requires a horse to pull it. Autoimmune means self-immune, and in autoimmune diseases, our bodies mistakenly make antibodies against proteins that actually belong in our bodies. Autoimmune antibodies cause disorders in which our body attacks itself. In the first section of this video series, we talked about thyroid cells called thyrocytes. Remember, the thyroid gland's function is controlled by TSH proteins made in the pituitary gland that bind to receptors in the thyroid gland, turning it on to produce the thyroid hormones T3 and T4. And we discussed how thyroid cells have a protein appendage that sticks out to which TSH, or thyroid stimulating hormone made by the pituitary, attaches. We call this appendage the TSH receptor because it receives the TSH protein. Again, when the TSH binds to the thyroid cell in a very specific fashion, much like the key lock analogy we've discussed, the thyroid cell produces hormones T4 and T3. In autoimmune or self-immune thyroid disorders, autoimmune antibodies mistakenly believe that the TSH receptor in the thyrocytes in the thyroid gland doesn't belong in the body and bind to it. There are other kinds of autoimmune antibodies involved in this system, but we're gonna focus on the TSH binding antibodies. Remember these antibodies are not supposed to be there. They are not supposed to bind to the thyroid cells and they can have unwanted effects either stimulating or blocking the TSH receptor. The antibodies may be free-floating or they may be attached to immune cells called lymphocytes. The binding of these antibodies can confuse the thyrocyte into believing a TSH molecule has bound to its receptor and the thyrocyte then starts making T3 and T4. In such cases, we say there is a stimulatory autoimmune antibody. Stimulating antibodies activate the TSH receptor and activate the thyroid cell, fooling it into making too much T3 and T4 thyroid hormone. This results in an overactive thyroid gland. Although incorrect, many people may call this Graves' disease. As an analogy, Think of the thyroid cell as being a fast food restaurant that makes hamburgers instead of T4 and T3 hormones. A stimulating antibody is like a school bus of kids pulling up to the restaurant and demanding loads of hamburgers all at once. The immediate hamburger production is greatly increased as long as the busload of kids is sitting there wanting more. So stimulating antibodies activate the thyroid cell. These antibodies binding to the TSH receptor, however, may be either stimulating or blocking. A blocking antibody turns off the thyroid cell's production of hormone by sitting on the TSH receptor and blocking TSH from binding there and turning on the thyroid cell. The analogy is the fellow standing in front of you at the restaurant's register holding up the line because he just can't make up his mind about what to order and so no hamburgers are produced. An absolutely essential point to remember is that we are glossing over the fact that these autoimmune antibodies are part of our overall immune system. The immune system is designed to have antibodies recognize things that don't belong in our bodies, bind to them, and then activate many other parts of our immune system to destroy those foreign things. Thus, both stimulating and inhibiting antibodies may stimulate local inflammation and tissue destruction, depending upon how altered the autoimmune antibody is. You'll remember this picture from section one of this series with the thyroid gland at the base of the neck and the pituitary gland at the base of the brain. Stimulatory autoimmune antibodies turn the thyroid gland on, as we've said. Here you see the autoimmune antibodies binding to the TSH receptors on the thyrocytes in the thyroid gland, increasing T4 and T3 hormone production, which in turn feed back onto the pituitary, decreasing TSH production. However, even though TSH production is turned off, the autoimmune antibodies already bound to the TSH receptors keep stimulating the production of T3 and T4. The result is abnormally high blood levels of T3 and T4 and very low levels of TSH. Whereas inhibitory autoimmune antibodies turn off the thyroid gland, the binding of the inhibitory antibodies to the TSH receptors turn off the production of T4 and T3. This turns off the inhibition of TSH production, or in effect, turns TSH production on. Even though TSH levels rise, 
the inhibitory autoimmune antibodies are still bound to the TSH receptors, blocking the binding of TSH, and so T3 and T4 levels continue to drop. The hallmark of inhibitory autoimmune disease is high TSH blood levels and low T3 and T4 blood levels. Autoimmune disorders, like autoimmune thyroid disorders, run in families and within an individual. That means that a person with one known autoimmune disorder has a greater chance than other people of having another autoimmune disorder. Likewise, autoimmune problems run in families. Someone with an autoimmune thyroid disorder may find that their mother, father, or siblings also have the same or other autoimmune disorders. Unfortunately, autoimmune disorders are quite frequent, and some of the more common disorders that you may be familiar with are listed here, and include rheumatoid arthritis, some forms of diabetes, lupus, and celiac disease. To summarize this video, people who have autoimmune antibodies mistakenly attack their own bodies with their immune system, causing what we call autoimmune disease. People who have one autoimmune disorder are likely to have other autoimmune disorders as well. In autoimmune thyroid disorders, autoimmune antibodies bind to the TSH receptor in thyrocytes in the thyroid gland and either turn the cells on if they are stimulating autoimmune antibodies or turn the gland off if they are inhibitory autoimmune antibodies.